We previously talked about what the living conditions in the Presnia and the general metropolitan areas were like under the monarchy before communism. Getting more specific, social class divisions were a main feature, where at the very bottom were the peasants, roughly 80% of the population, then you have the working class, which were about 4-6%, to then the royals, nobles, and the clergy were about 12-13%. to The lower classes were sold on the idea of communism in part by the slogan Peace, Bread, and Land, which was in part one of this series. But something we didn't really get into was what was the end goal of this new system they had fought for? The topic of communism can open up a very long conversation because people rarely agree with each other's interpretations of Marx's writings, so no matter how one might describe it, someone somewhere will have a problem with it. The point here is not to talk about the theory, not to discuss the merits or the lack thereof of communism either, but to present it as it happened for the people just to provide context without taking too much away from the main story. To achieve that, we have to have at least a frame of reference as to what they wanted to achieve in the first place. Fool's errand? Maybe. But going into it, even if for just a tiny bit, can give us a better idea of what these guys were dealing with and why the many changes that we're going to see coming their way were happening. In order to be as brief as we can, we'll refer to a dictionary, and as cheesy as it is, the dictionary exists for a reason. Its concise nature is exactly what we need right now. So taking that approach, here we go. The dictionary says, Communism is a doctrine based on revolutionary Marxian socialism and Marxism-Leninism that was the official ideology of the Soviet Union. A theory advocating the elimination of private property, a system in which goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed. Also, a totalitarian system of government in which a single authoritarian party controls state-owned means of production and the final stage of society in Marxist theory in which the state has withered away and economic goods are distributed equitably. Now, before passing judgment on those people for deciding to go down that path, let's keep their situation in mind. It shouldn't be hard to see how for someone who was born into abject poverty, oppressed from the jump, with absolutely no hope to change their situation no matter the amount of work, that someone wouldn't think twice about choosing a system like that. Then multiply that someone by millions. Considering that the average Russian experience was that of a peasant lifestyle, just based on the sheer number of them, remember, 80% of the population. So yeah, they were basically like, hey, let's have a system where that 80% of the population, the peasants, will become part of the working class and workers will be the most important, the centerpiece of this system. That thing about the haves and have-nots? Forget that. In this system, nobody will really own anything privately, everything will belong to the people, and one day, we'll have produced so much that everybody will live in abundance. It'll be difficult initially, but we will all work super hard to produce as much as possible, and the state will distribute everything, work, food, goods, housing, between everybody so that nobody gets greedy like those who came before us. Eventually, we won't need the state for distribution anymore, but for now, that's how it will be. So that's what they were hoping to achieve. And given their struggles, again, it's not hard to see why they would buy into this, right? In part one, we also got into how the Statistins grew up, what their environment was like, and how their lives were being shaped by this revolution. We left off with the Bolsheviks who were now in power at war with the white movement who represented the old government and were trying to regain control of the nation from the communists. This civil war led to a major shortage of goods and people were struggling to survive. This struggle led to an exodus of the population from the urban centers and into the countryside. 
the Starostins followed suit, except for Nikolai and Alexander, who had stayed behind in Moscow. With all that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into part two. This is Round History. It's entertainment, a little bit educational, a little bit instructional, instructional, instructional. With people's attention turned towards surviving, somehow football managed to keep going, at least for those who sought to keep it going. In cities closer to the battle lines, like the old capital, Petrograd, there were very few places and players left to play. Moscow, though, was still able to maintain a air quote scene, if you will, albeit much weaker than before, which is understandable. It was almost like a bottleneck situation, the previously existing infrastructure remained largely unchanged, but we can't say the same for the human material. For example, the Moscow clubs like Oleus, KFS, ZKS, and RGO were still around, along with their fields, stadiums, and equipment. Their patrons, though, were mostly gone, with the exception of some like Gubiev at ZKS and the old captain Mikheyev at RGO. A good number of the prominent players that were active before the revolution in 1917 stayed, but the departure of so many others left a huge void. A lot of the experienced referees and, and general organizers were also gone. The bright side of this is that the change allowed for less privileged social groups who before had been excluded to more actively participate in play as well as in a supporter's role. This exclusion seemed to be a common theme in a lot of countries when football was first introduced by the Brits. Typically, it would come through a British merchant who would end up teaching those they came in contact with, the locals. Usually, those who would be mingling with these merchants were members of the wealthier class in those countries, and thus the game would initially be viewed and restricted to these classes. Well, moving on. Logically, with the loss of these established players, the quality of play would inevitably suffer, since the newcomers had no experience in a structured setting. Mind you, they still played, but in the streets and not organized games. The communists had adopted a policy of international isolation, which made it harder to acquire new equipment. There was less free time, they lacked food and fuel, and scarcity of electricity meant that trams were unavailable during the weekends. Well, that's when most matches were played. But still, when there's a will, there's a way. So, determined players and supporters went to matches on foot, with some of these walking several hours. And when we talk about the game suffering in quality, surely all these extra negative factors must have affected performances as well. At the end of the day, though, you can't help but be impressed by how much these people wanted their football. With nine clubs in 1918, as the Moscow League managed to hang around, though several changes were made and players were shuffled between teams, the most relevant to this story was Ivan Artemyev, who would end up moving from Novogirieva to KFS. Ivan was distinguished by Andrei as, quote, one of the most peculiar and respected people in our football. His enthusiasm and love for football were boundless, end quote. Artemyev was eventually joined at KFS by fellow Novogirieva teammate Pavel Kwanunikov after the Novogirieva team was broken up. Kwanunikov, being a childhood idol of Andrei, was depicted as such. Quote, Kwanunikov was really the idol of my childhood and youth. He was one of those celebrities who don't even need such distinctions as a last name. All of Russian football called him Pavel. And if in conversations, arguments, or stories, someone uttered that name, then the ones present never asked who it was about. 
they already knew it was about Kwanunikov, end quote. He goes on to say that Kwanunikov had a peculiar figure. His body had weird proportions. He was medium height, had narrow shoulders, but had big hips, which likely contributed to his well-known balance. He was famous for appending opponents. It usually happened during aerial disputes, except that he wouldn't jump. He'd stay planted, and when the opponents jumped above him, he would ever so gently nudge his hip and send the enemy head down to huge applause of the crowds. Obviously an illegal move by today's standards, but people still get away with it if they sneak it in just right, even today. Kwanunikov was also known for his elegance and making the game look effortless. So continuing, Nikolai remained with RGO, where he played alongside Konstantin Kvashnin. Now this guy was a beast of an athlete. He had won the Moscow Boxing Championship. He was also a Moscow champion in Greco-Roman, weightlifting and speed skating. So did I mention he was a beast of an athlete? Anyway, the RGO organization would begin to find themselves in a sticky situation with the Bolsheviks. The Svobodch decree of compulsory military training wasn't being followed by them, and their Slavophilia went against the party's ideas. Now switching gears a little bit, in August, after a public speech, Lenin got shot in another assassination attempt, but survived. The press coverage for this attempt was wide, and that played a big role in creating a lot of sympathy and increasing his popularity among the population. Now Lenin was ready to unleash the Cheka and Georginsky on them. Trotsky, for his part, would organize the Red Army. In September, Lenin would announce a decree by the name of Red Terror. If that sounds sinister, well, that's because it is. The idea, according to a Bolshevik revolutionary called Grigory Zinoviev, was, quote, To overcome our enemies, we must have our own socialist militarism. We must carry along with us 90 million out of 100 million of Soviet Russia's population. As for the rest, we have nothing to say to them. They must be annihilated. End quote. Even scarier was how they were going about it. The words of Martin Latsis, chief of the Ukrainian Cheka, should give us an idea. He said, quote, Do not look in the file of incriminating evidence to see whether or not the accused rose up against the Soviets with arms or words. Ask him instead to which class he belongs, what is his background. His education, his profession, these are the questions that will determine the fate of the accused. That is the meaning and essence of the Red Terror. End quote. There was an increasing number of cities going through famine from chronic food shortages. Peasants who were able to build a, a relatively decent amount of wealth became known as kulaks. And they ended up being the scapegoats by Lenin and were accused of hoarding grain in order to increase its value. Now, whether they did or not has been disputed, but in any case, Lenin commanded that the grain be confiscated from the kulaks. It wouldn't take a genius to figure out that a lot of these people would put up a fight. Not that Lenin was opposed to a fight either. He was a believer in the use of force. If that hasn't been made clear by the term Red Terror, we need only to hear what he said prior to the Winter Palace takeover. He said, quote, The state is an institution built up for the sake of exercising violence. Previously, this violence was exercised by a handful of money bags over the entire people. Now we want to organize violence in the interests of the people. End quote. Wow. The state is an institution built up for the sake of violence, he says. That's not just the mind of someone who wanted to change things. That is an extremely angry mind. Now, I know we've gone a little bit far off topic here, but allow me to go even a little bit further just to get a better understanding of that angry mind. There are a ton of books that can provide great insight. One such book is Conspirator, Lenin in Exile by Helen Rappaport. So for the sake of context, we'll go into a little bit of how he went from Vladimir Ulyanov to Lenin, but for the sake of brevity, we'll keep this as short as we can. Lenin was born Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov on April 10th, 1870. If you listened to the first part of this series, 
you might remember that the serfs had been freed only nine years earlier. Vladimir was the son of a science teacher in his father and a mother who taught herself German, French, and English. So from the jump, this isn't a dumb family by any means. His father held conservative views, was a Russian Orthodox church member, and was an admirer of the Tsar, exactly because of the Emancipation Manifesto that freed the serfs. Although it's unclear if he realized that this freedom was all smoke and mirrors. In any case, from a young age, Vladimir was academically inclined. After his father died from a brain hemorrhage, a then 16-year-old Vladimir renounced his faith in God. He ripped the cross from his neck, threw it down and spat on it. He also idolized his older brother, Alexander, who was a science student. Well, Alexander became a member of the Narodnaya Volia, or the People's Will. This was an organization that advocated for socialism, faith in the people, the overthrow of the autocracy, and democratic representation. But they carried out their message in form of terror. They had already assassinated the previous Tsar and was planning to do the same with the then current Tsar. Alexander got caught before he could carry out the attempt and was hanged by the Tsar. And this was through the strangulation method, mind you, not the trapdoor quick death method. So judging by how Vladimir reacted to when his father died, how would you guess his reaction to the killing of his brother was? Well, if you guessed fire and brimstone, you're on to something. However, he didn't believe that single acts of terror were useful at all. He believed in achieving revolution through the ideas of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Historian Joel Carmichael, in his work A Short History of the Russian Revolution, explained the pull of Karl Marx's work as this, quote, Perhaps the chief appeal that Marxism held for the Russian intelligentsia, even more so for the intellectuals of other countries, was its combination of a powerful messianic yearning with an appearance of scientific methodology. It offered youthful enthusiasts the best of both worlds, their ardent desire to change the world forfeited by sound or seemingly sound scientific reasons as to why this was not only possible, but was even more seductively inevitable. As far as Russia was concerned, Marxism may be summed up as the contention that Russian history is a part of world history, and that, because of this, Russia must pass through capitalism in order to reach the future socialist society. It was not the peasantry, Marxists thought, that would be able to lead the march to socialism, but the industrial working class. Terrorism had to be abandoned as a tactic that was both futile, that was both futile and, in view of the objectively developing social forces, superfluous. The main task of the revolutionary leaders was to be the creation of a disciplined working class party to conduct Russia into the promised land. End quote. In any case, he was now the brother of a state criminal. And despite facing roadblocks, he managed to go to university and study law, uh, Marx and Engels, got into politics, and got involved with other Marxists. He was arrested in 1897 after supporting some labor strikes and sent to exile in Siberia. He got out in 1900, left Russia, gave himself the pseudonym Lenin. Uh, speculation is that it was based on the river Lena. He eventually met other revolutionaries like Trotsky, Zinoviev, Lev Kamenev, Dzerzhinsky, Stalin, and others. The group split up into the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. They returned to Russia, and we start to catch up with part one of the series, where we see the 1905 revolution, Bloody Sunday, Krasnaya Presnya, World War I, the Russian Revolution, which brings us to the Red Terror and Lenin's use of violence. Anyway, Lenin was all in for revolution. Christopher Reed, in his book Lenin, a Revolutionary, elaborates on Lenin's use of violence. He says, quote, In the communist morality to which Lenin subscribed, the greatest good was the good of the revolution. Whatever served the revolution was right. There were no qualms about whether ends justified means. It was a given that the end of revolution justified almost any means. 
Lenin frequently said that one could not make an omelette without breaking eggs. There would have to be a necessary amount of suffering for the cause to triumph. For Lenin, to argue along these lines was not a matter of principle alone. It was simply reality. Revolution would be a violent act, like its cousin, war. End quote. So when these quote-unquote wealthier peasants, if you can call peasants wealthy, the kulaks, had begun to revolt against the grain requisition imposed on them, they were classified as enemies of the state. They were now on the same level as the white movement in the eyes of the communists. Class enemies like the bourgeois, the nobility, and the clergy. They were enemies of the people. And that is not a title you want bestowed upon you. Just as an example, in response to a Kulak uprising in the city of Penza, Lenin had sent a letter saying the following, quote, Comrades, the Kulak uprising in your five districts must be crushed without pity. You must make an example of these people. One, hang. I mean hang publicly so that people can see it. At least a hundred Kulaks, rich bastards, and known blood suckers. Two, publish their names. Three, seize all their grain. Four, single out the hostages per my instructions in yesterday's telegram. Do all this so that for miles around, people see it all, understand it, tremble, and tell themselves that we are killing the bloodthirsty Kulaks and that we will continue to do so. Yours, Lenin. P.S. Find tougher people. End quote. I mean... As morbidly funny as P.S. Find Tougher People is, this is as ruthless as it gets, and it certainly gives weight to the title of Red Terror. Modest estimates put the number of summary executions at around 10,000. So we have in Lenin this person who basically masterminded, for a lack of a better term, the Bolshevik Revolution and all of this. And his ideas are what will drive the Soviet Union in this period, and the people, the Starostans, have to navigate their way through these changes. Let's skip ahead to 1920. All citizens from the age of 16 and 50 were obligated to work now as part of a universal labor conscription. After the revolution, there were no more hunts by the upper class, as you can imagine, there'd be no room for something like that in a communist way of life. The money bags that Lenin and the Bolsheviks hated were some of the same people paying for these hunting trips led by the Starostins. Now, having to do whatever they could to survive, Peter Starostin, their dad, had gone on to trade some of their belongings for food. His prized guns were exchanged each for two sacks of rye flour. They had an Isaac Leviton painting that was traded for a sack of potatoes. Just saying that out loud is painful. Leviton was such an incredibly talented painter, he's supposed to have made a huge contribution to the mood landscape genre. While I can't say that I necessarily get all that, personally what I really really love is his technique. The way he captured light, and this is gonna sound super geeky, but I've honestly gotten goosebumps from some of his paintings, and I've never even seen one in person. I don't know what it is, just something about them just resonated. I'd love to know which painting the Starostins had. In any case, it's sad that they had to get rid of it. These paintings are really valuable. Just like the prized guns, and here they were, literally being traded for potatoes. So, when their father Peter had made it back from Moscow to Pagost, their mother found a huge louse inside the collar of his shirt. They figured the bug had made its way onto him on the train ride and bit him. Then, from that, he contracted typhus, which makes perfect sense, being that the conditions brought on by the Civil War had created a typhoid epidemic. And it was no joke. Just in 1921, it ended up killing an estimated 3 million people. This is one of those diseases that crop up during wars and natural disasters, you know, these scenarios where sanitation and hygiene take a back seat to basic survival and tend to dip below desirable standards. When that happens, it leads to an uptick in lice populations, and then the disease spreads, 
and whatever devastation was already laid out by the original cause just gets exacerbated. Nowadays, once infected, the person is prescribed antibiotics and luckily there's a vaccine that can prevent it, but it wasn't invented until 1943. Their dad would have likely experienced fever and flu-like symptoms about a week or two after the bite. Within five to ten days after that, a rash would have developed on his body and he would begin to show signs of meningoencephalitis. We're talking sensitivity to light, severe headaches, delirium, possibly this neck stiffness that doesn't let you bring your chin down, so you're constantly looking up, and possibly other extremely undesirable symptoms as well. He was a proud man and, for whatever reason, maybe in a delirious state, refused to take in the medicine that they were trying to give him. He would just spit it out. It's not clear what they gave him either, apart from Nikolai stating that he was given powders. Andrei couldn't make sense of it. Describing his confusion when his father was sick in bed, he said, quote, I couldn't understand the incongruity of cause and effect. Such a mighty father and such an insignificant insect. And now we kneel before his bed with our weeping mother, Peter and Vera, who understood even less than I what was happening, end quote. Peter and Vera being the younger siblings. We go back to how in their culture, Men have to portray strength, not appear weak. Now, here was their father, who killed mighty beasts for a living, and spent days toughing it out in the swamps, marshes, and forests all year round, in the heat as well as the Russian winter. Here he was, defeated by a bug. As kids naturally tend to idolize their fathers, it was a given that Peter was seen as this monumentally strong character, It must have been a complete mental whiplash for the kids. It was February, and Peter Starostin had become one of the fatalities of the typhoid epidemic in Russia. Not a great way to go out by any means, and it could have taken him just about a month to die after being bitten. Still in Moscow, Nikolai would receive a telegram with three words he would never forget. These words were father is dead. To make matters worse, the telegram had taken about three days to make its way to Moscow. The train Alexander and Nikolai took back to Pagost took an entire day, so by the time they had reached the village, Peter Starostin had already been buried. This was the sacrifice we mentioned at the end of part one. In staying behind, trying to make something of themselves in Moscow, not only did they lose the chance to be by their father's side as he passed, they didn't even make it to the funeral. And just like that, along with all the difficulties they had been facing, like a team heroically defending wave after wave of attack from a relentless and superior opponent, hoping to get a break and maybe, just maybe get a counterattack, instead... They find themselves down on the scorecards due to some unfortunate goal that shouldn't have stood. They're dealt one of those blows that can make or break a team. But, in the famous words of Tupac Shakur, life goes on, and Nikolai became the patriarch of the family. Seemingly from one day to the next, at age 18, he was now responsible for all of them. I mean, this is always relative, because we can always find worse scenarios, but... Try to place yourself in his shoes at 18. There's a civil war happening, famine all around, your father just died, and you're now the head of the family. I was an idiot at 18. I mean, that gives me some perspective for sure. It also caused the younger siblings to grow up faster. With the family struggling, Andre, who wasn't even 16 yet, took to plowing the fields to help the family survive. It was then that he realized that his childhood had come to an end. The death of their father was hard on all of them, including their uncle Mitya, who was devastated. Remember, they were incredibly close, living together their entire lives. In fact, a book which could be translated as The Starostin Brothers by Georgi Mazorov and Boris Duhon. In the book, they indicate that they were twins. There's evidence to support that finding in the form of documents. In any case, that would explain the brothers' proximity to one another. Andrei described his uncle as an 
quote, In his heart, he was a kind man, strict in appearance, cruel in words, soft in practice, end quote. And it was also sometime in the early 20s that Uncle Mitya would suffer another blow. His only son, Ivan, or as he was called in the house, Vanyushka, had given up on his dream of becoming an ice skating champion, this coming after witnessing a tragic event. The ice track had an inner circle in which was separated by a wooden barrier. Some athletes had to skate along the inner path, their shoulder almost touching the barrier. Curious audience members from inside the circle piled on a barrier and one of the boards, unable to withstand the pressure, broke down and the sharp end moved towards the approaching athletes. Coming out from behind the turn to the straight line, an ice skater swooped down on the sharp end of the board at full speed and it went right through him. The man immediately fell dead on the ice. This was enough for their cousin Ivan, or Vanyushka, to lose his love for ice skating. By then, the Garyushka was no longer, but the Burlova, which was a pub from the old Garyushka days, had reopened, and their cousin would become a regular. The cold irony in this is that their uncle had been worried sick about the boys back in the day getting lost by the dark temptations of the cynical Garyushka, now only to find his own son in that exact situation. Their uncle Mitya, as we already know, was a conservative, and as such, he hated football and even mocked the kids for playing. But he would eventually come around to liking it. He began slowly by unexpectedly showing up to a match at the stadium. The way Andre tells this, it's hilarious. He says, quote, After that first visit to the stadium, Uncle Mitya kept silent for a long time. Still, unwilling to admit to giving up his conservative views, when he was talking about football, he yawned, trying to emphasize his indifference to the topic. But he did not hurry away to his room anymore. Before, when the topic of football arose in the house, he would prefer to go out on the street with a broom and sweep the whole street. And yet, ice began to melt. We all realized that a new spring blossomed in Uncle Mitya's heart when, after the successful performance of the Soviet national team against the Turks, he suddenly asked, as if hiding an intense interest under a mask of indifference, quote, Why didn't Pavel play? End quote. When they explained to him that Kwanunikov was sick, he edified objectively, quote, When it is necessary to defend the national team, one should not be ill. End quote. Andre continues, And then everything when according to the norms of the classical development of the disease. First, inquiries about the upcoming rival, then questions about the roster. After a while, questions were replaced with recommendations, who to play and whom to replace. Then come the rigorous demands phase. And then he quotes his uncle again, quote, Do not put that guy on. That son of a bitch can't even catch a cold. End quote. Then he continues, And at the end, is the last stage of the disease, after which the disease turns into a chronic, incurable passion. Instructions are given on tactics with reference to examples from the history of wars, the Brusilov Offensive, the Battle of Tsushima, etc. Soon, the football proselyte stopped sweeping with the broom on Sundays, began attending training sessions, and did not miss a single football match of our team in his free time, end quote. Ha. Huh. So Andre points to the fact that his uncle was no longer part of the church choir, which freed up time for a new hobby, combined with football being simply an irresistible sport. Well, that's one way to explain it. But it could also be that Uncle Mitya felt a certain degree of responsibility for his brother's kids. With how close they were, these kids must have been like his own children. Plus, his only son had become a drunk. He might have needed something positive in his life. It was also during this time, from about 1920 to 1921, that Nikolai Starostin became really engaged in a sweet science. It's not hard to imagine how boxing would have been a tremendously therapeutic way to take his frustration out after losing his father, especially in the manner that it all went down. It's something we'll never know as he's no longer around to ask, but... The fact that his boxing stint lasted for about a year or so could point to it helping him deal with the loss. 
What we do know, though, is that his Stianka Nastenku experience was influential in how fast he developed as a pugilist. He went on to be the light heavyweight champion in the rookie division in Moscow, in a place where fighting is so embedded in a culture that's not bad at all. The oldest Starostin was also working as an accountant at the Central Repair Workers' Workshop. In the summer, Andrei ended up moving to Moscow to live with Nikolai and to work at the same workshop as well. But his job was as an assistant locksmith. In their free time, Nikolai, Alexander, and Andrei dabbled in theater. They mostly watched, but occasionally they performed as well. Eventually, Andrei would grow really fond of theater and become really involved. Andrei took to the world of art for real. He would attend classical performances as well as more innovative ones like improv. Now, I know we've been dancing around the topic of football and really just talking about mostly other things, but we're trying to paint a picture here for you. In just a little bit, though, we will get more in-depth about the football world in general. So just to finish up building a bigger picture here, the Communist Party always seemed to have inner conflicts And one of them was the fact that Leon Trotsky wanted to do away with trade unions while Lenin wanted to keep them going for a while longer. As a result of such disagreements, Lenin banned dissent from within the party. Then they would have yet another problem to deal with. As if the government's appropriation of grain wasn't enough, they were hit with a drought. A terrible famine would strike them in 1921. It was concentrated in the Volga and Ural River regions, which was east and southeast of Moscow. This was followed by several more peasant uprisings. Sailors in Kronstadt revolted as well, but after the Red Army was sent in, led by Trotsky himself, thousands were killed and thrown into labor camps. Most sources say that this famine went on to claim an estimated 5 million lives. We're talking people, kids, looking like skeletons dying in the streets. The pictures are horrific. Accounts of cannibalism, just nightmarish stuff. At this point, the government was forcing religious institutions to give up their valuables to be used in exchange for aid to the starving. Even though the Communist Party was an atheist movement, we have to remember there were many, many religious people in Russia at the time. Now, in the soccer world of the capital, in the fall of 1921, Ivan Artemyev, who we said earlier was one of those main, prominent players left around, would propose the creation of the Moscow Sports Circle. This was to be a club made up of athletes living in and around the Presnya district. Ivan was one of the best players in the league, winning it multiple times. He was a constant presence in the Moscow selection. He had played for Novogereva in the pre-revolutionary years and he was now playing for KFS of Nikolai Yubiev. This is someone who Nikolai would eventually describe as his godfather in football. And the two shared some commonalities as well. For example, the Artemyevs were also a footballing brotherhood and Ivan was the elder. They had also gone back to their family village in the Rizan province during hard times and they lost their father in a fire in 1919. So Ivan Artemyev was a great influence on Nikolai Starostin as well as Russian football in the early years. Something that seemed to be common among the players of the time was a lack of political interest or activity, at least as far as the records show. In that respect, Ivan Artemyev, along with his younger brother, Peter, were in a unique position. They were very much involved members of the Bolshevik party, and that's something that Nikolai never quite seemed to inherit from Artemyev's influence. By trade, Ivan was a shoemaker, but he also worked as an instructor for the Vsevobuch. This was a universal military training for men created by the Soviet government, and it was geared towards workers and peasants at the time. His brother Peter worked in the Presninsky District Committee of the Komsomol. The Komsomol, or the All-Union Leninist Young Communist League, was a political youth organization that promoted the values of the Communist Party based on the ideal young communist. Historian Matthias Newman, in his article called Revolutionizing Mind and Soul, Soviet Youth and Cultural Campaigns During the New Economic Policy, 1921 through 1928. I mean, 
That is a long title. Anyway, he described that the ideal young communist needed to be, quote, a lively, active, healthy, disciplined youngster who subordinates himself to the collective and is prepared for and dedicated to learn, study, and work, end quote. On the flip side, they highly discouraged drinking, smoking, sexual promiscuity, and religion. So basically Mormons minus the religious bit, right? But in all seriousness, this should give us an idea of what the Komsomol was about. Particularly, Ivan's younger brother, Peter, who was 100% bought into it. Having an in with organizations within the Communist Party had its benefits as well, as we'll see later on. But in this case, this is how it helped Ivan Artemyev in his own words. Quote, My brother Peter worked in the Presnesky District Committee of the Komsomol. He was always aware of all the sports events in the region and Moscow and certainly knew all our needs perfectly well. He played for the second KFS team. Therefore, it is by no means accidental that one fine autumn day, I appeared in the Presnesky District Committee of the Komsomol and asked them to help us to take possession of the site near the Presnenskaya outpost, which was abandoned and neglected, end quote. The site he speaks of was known as Fizicek, and it's located where the Moskovskaya Pravda is today. Back then, it was supposedly a sports ground, which first had been turned into a potato field, then became a wasteland. Since the response he got from the Komsomol was an enthusiastic yes, why not see how far the bamboo will bend, right? So he then explained that they needed to build a pitch they needed goals and a building with locker rooms, stands and a fence, just like the other league clubs. But for all that to happen, they needed money. It was a good try, but the answer was a resounding no. They told him he could ask whatever he wanted, but there was no money. So, since there was no money, and he could ask whatever he wanted, he did. He asked for a house, saying how he would disassemble it, move it themselves, and rebuild it with everything they needed. That request was accepted, so then he asked for one more thing, to arrange charity concerts. That way, they could use the proceeds to hire carpenters. They'd do all that digging themselves, but they needed carpenters to build a facility. To his surprise, his requests to the Komsomol were approved that same day. For their building, they were given a two-story abandoned house that previously belonged to a merchant who was exiled after the revolution. For Ivan... Whether he knew it or not, this was to be the beginning of something special. Like he was planting a small Siberian pine seed that one day would grow into a tree reaching over 30 meters tall. Ivan Artemyev then sent out a bat signal across Moscow and several notable players of the time heeded his call. From KFS, not counting the Artemyevs, came goalkeeper Stanislav Mizger, defender Tekstin, and the Kwanunikov brothers, who the eldest, Pavel, was one of the greatest attackers in Soviet football at the time. Argyo Sokol had been a Bolshevik target and was likely not going to survive much longer. A year later, the organization would be banned in Russia and the leaders exiled from the country. Whether or not this downward spiral was the reason, the Starostins, along with defender Vladimir Haydn, midfielder Konstantin Kvashnin and forward Dmitry Maslov, and lastly, Viktor Prokofiev from VZP, were all joining this newly created club. Things were looking very good for the Presnya residents, but there was still all the building work to be done, plus getting money for the rest. So they all worked on these concerts or performances. The venue would be the Prokhorov factory's big kitchen. Now, by then, Prokhorov had been renamed Trehkorka after being nationalized by the communists. They had a hard time finding artists who would accept the invitation, with the problem being in the lack of transportation, plus the delays in getting the concert started. They did end up convincing a popular musician of the time, though, and on a day of the premiere, when a shift at the factory was coming to an end, and before the next one started, Pavel Kwanunikov was at the entrance selling tickets. Being such a huge name in Moscow, he was able to attract a myriad of people who just wanted to see him and got them to buy tickets. People were flattered just to be able to get tickets from the hands of Kwanunikov himself. The show would have an eclectic variety of acts. As Artemyev explains, quote, By the beginning of the concert, the hall was full, 
interlacing with professional poets, singers, songwriters, weightlifters, defender Konstantin Kovashinin played the balalaika, fought and smashed bricks on his head. Artemyev would even sing a duet with Stanislav's Leuta's sister, who was a professional singer. A successful night was confirmed after they had settled with the performers and saw the amount of cash they had left. For their next concert, it was suggested to Ivan that he use his old horse to pull a carriage carrying a bear from the circus to promote challengers to a wrestling match against said bear. This horse was one of the only things the Artemyevs were able to bring back from the fire in their home village. He described the horse as an old nag that, quote, even the gypsies who intended to steal it turned it away, end quote. Despite a few snags, they were able to get the event going. But then came another problem. The Komsomol started to push their agenda and imposed the condition that the concerts could only start after the party and that means the Communist Party, had finished giving the audience their reports, basically a way to make people listen to their rhetoric. The problem was that the speakers were late, and once they started, their speeches would take all night. They started to lose audience and even performers who just couldn't sit there long enough doing nothing for hours. They had to move the performances to a paint factory nearby. They put on a few more of these concerts and made more money, but it just wasn't enough. So Vanya, as Andrei Starostin would refer to Ivan Artemyev, decided to make a sacrifice of Jack and a Beanstalk proportion. In what many considered an act of insanity, Ivan Artemyev went back to his home village of Rizan and sold his cow. He exchanged his cow for the ball, they would say about him. Now, we have to keep in mind that there was virtually no money in the game back then, certainly when compared to today's game. In modern times, to dedicate yourself to becoming a professional, while many do make real sacrifices, it's completely understandable. There's a set path, a blueprint, and while the risk is high, so too can be the reward. Well, back then, it wasn't even a profession to begin with. Only 10 years prior, people were still making fun of these silly dudes wearing shorts chasing after a ball. So there wasn't a path to riches or anything of that sort, and he was a staunch communist anyway. Profiting wouldn't have been part of his mentality. In the end, this guy was making sacrifices, but for what? To people, it seemed crazy. He was a lunatic. To someone like Artemyev, though, if there wasn't a path, he would forge one. He was truly doing it for the love of the game. And that in itself can be contagious. By March of 1922, they seemed to have enough money to begin construction. They had some help from Red Army soldiers who were happy to take the old merchant's house apart. But when it came time to move the material, the soldiers wanted none of it. So the precious logs had to be left there with no one to look over them. When they were finally ready to move them, about half of the material had been stolen by surrounding inhabitants to use for firewood. Somehow, Ivan managed to get the location of the stolen goods. He was furious and decided to get them back. Since he worked at the Sevobuch, he knew where they stored weapons and uniforms. He and Stanislav Leuta, dressed as soldiers and with rifles, went down to the thieves' den. After scaring the living daylights out of the bandits, they took back their items, but they didn't stop there. They went as far as imposing a fine, they even issued a receipt. A couple of days later, the thieves actually took the receipts to the police, which somehow were on the thieves' side and summoned Artemyev. Luckily, Ivan got away due to his involvement with the Komsomol. But what the hell happened to the thieves? How were they not arrested for admitting to stealing is beyond me. Anyway, they were finally able to construct their facility with the help of many local youth, when the stadium was done, Artemyev would describe it as, quote, At last we didn't have to be among strangers in the street and changing to our uniforms in the bushes. We now had a home. There were locker rooms, restrooms, and even a buffet with toffee and kvass. Immediately work began for the weightlifters, wrestlers, cyclists, football players, and hockey players. From morning till evening, the house buzzed like a beehive, end quote. The mansion that they had rescued 
would be used to house other sports as well, like gymnastics and track. A ton of athletes from the Presnia were benefiting from this institution. No doubt that all this effort and ingenuity that was displayed by Artemiev must have influenced Nikolai's love of the game. Here's a man he looked up to, literally giving everything for the game. And it worked. Artemiev's love of the game, actually obsession for the game, could be best described by Andrei's words. He said, quote, He was a master of football. In the Novogiriva team, Vanya, as his teammates called him, occupied the left wing. But at the new club, he was playing in the central midfield. Usually, the player in this role must be fully armed with football skills, be able to run along and across the field, have the technique to send the ball the right distance, and if necessary, strike at goal from a long distance, and, of course, have a sound mind. Since the entire tactical course of the game begins mainly with this player, Vanya possessed all these qualities to a sufficient degree to become one of the best center mids in Moscow. I would say he had an obsession with football. Vanya was a pure soul man. He would painfully frown upon hearing a curse word. Do I need to prove how much he had to endure spending his whole life in a not-so-delicate environment such as the one in football? He was a respectable family man. End quote. Naturally, Ivan was a team leader, and it was his influence as captain that brought Nikolai Starostin into the first team and sort of took him under his wing. As for the rest of the team, we mentioned the names before, but here is what it would look like. The formation, by the way, was a 2-3-5. If you're not really a soccer head or a football head and you're not too familiar with formations, we're talking about two defenders, which were the two fullbacks, three midfielders, a right mid, a center mid, and a left mid, and then five forwards. You heard that right. Two wingers, right and left. Then you have two inside forwards, again, right and left, and then the center forward, obviously in the center. It's so aggressive, but it's awesome. I've always wondered what that would look like, and it looks way better than I thought from the little footage that I've been able to gander. For some reason, I had in mind that they would all sit up front for some reason, but it's pretty fluid, and the forwards do go back and help out too. And pretty much every single team in that era throughout the world played this formation. So going back to the roster, here we have, and this will sound painful, but I assure you that no podcaster will be harmed during the pronunciation of these names. So, here we go. Goalkeeper Stanislav Mizgir, defenders Pavel Tikstin and Vladimir Haydn, in midfield Konstantin Kvashnin, Ivan Artemiev and Anatoly Kwanunikov, the forwards were our own Nikolai Statistin on the right wing, Viktor Prokofiev, Mitri Maslov, Pavel Kwanunikov, and Peter Artemiev completed the attack. Well, I guess I survived. And a Russian speaker will probably be like, what are you talking about survived? You said it all wrong anyway. In any case, this is probably like when you first start watching Game of Thrones. Too many characters to remember. But in this case, uh, all the characters' names are mispronounced, and in this case, it's okay, there's no need to remember them all. But if you were following closely, you would have heard the name Artemiev twice, once for Ivan and the other one for Peter, who we've already talked about, were half of the Artemiev Brotherhood. You would have also heard Anatoly Kwanunikov and Pavel Kwanunikov. The Kwanunikovs, likewise, were a brotherhood of four with three of the brothers playing soccer and the elder, Alexander, being an ice skater. Together with the Starostins, these two families would all be part of the Presnius ranks. This helped create a bond, a strong sense of identity within and around the club. It was also at this time that Andrei Starostin would join organized football for the first time. Following his older brothers Nikolai and Alexander, Alexander, of course, was still playing for the youth ranks, there were also Viktor Prokofiev and Peter Popov, who would eventually marry the Starostin sisters. So we can add brothers-in-law to that family too. Nikolai Starostin would describe their tight-knit club like this. Quote, we were poor, but not the soul. The stadium was a second home. Wives and children were present at games and training sessions. Our stadium 
didn't just exist, it lived, end quote. André, looking back, had this to say, quote, The main advantage of football life in the club was the unity of generations. At the Moscow Championship, there were six teams of adults and children. To play for the sixth team, it was necessary to get up at seven in the morning. And yet, in the younger kids' games, early in the morning, there were the elder ones, not afraid of fatigue. They had come to see the boys play. The connection of generations was inseparable. After work or school, they ran to the club, afraid, God forbid, to skip training or of just missing out on talking to the guys for a single day. You'd get exhausted from the anguish. There were the news too. Who was selected in the team? Who was in? Who was not? But most importantly, there were all the same lifelong captivating sounds. Boom. 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 First, boys and teenagers hitting the ball. Then, an older generation. And then, the first team ran out onto the field. End quote. So we can see how there was a real sense of community within this club. And it came naturally due to their relationships with each other and the people in the district. There was a lot of excitement around the new club. It wasn't only because of the local nature, but also because their squad had some exciting talent in it. The name of Krasnaya Presnya was actually suggested, but many of the players that had come from Argio Sokol, including the Starostens, were against it. They argued that Argio had tradition. Most of the experience was coming from there, and it mattered to have its name carried. There was much discussion and in the end, it was decided that the new club would be called Moscow Sports Club. The funny thing is, the fans referred to the team as Krasnaya Presnya anyway. And in yours truly's humble opinion, it sounds way more badass. On April 18th, 1922, they would make their debut as a club. In a friendly against ZKS, six-time Moscow League champions, the newly established club would win by 3-2. ZKS, by the way, had denied the transfer request put in by their forward, Peter Isakov, who was known as the professor. He wanted to play for Krasnaya Presnya, but ended up having to sit the season out instead. Anyway, after that win, they became the talk of Moscow. They followed that win with two absolute beatdowns. First was SKL by 10-1, and then Union by 11-0. But still, these were all friendlies. Almost a week later, on April 23rd, they'd played their first official match. The football year in Moscow would start with the Maitov Cup, an event that would bring together the six best teams in Moscow. They then would go head-to-head -head in sort of a skills challenge, things like 60 meters run, dribbling, shots, etc. Each skill awarding a certain amount of points, and the two teams with the most points would then play a proper match. That year, it just so happened that the two best teams were Moscow Sports Club and ZKS, who were now eager to avenge their loss from their first meeting. So the two teams met again, and this time, Moscow Sports Club would prove, with an emphatic 5-1 demolishing, that the hype was real. Things were looking up. In their first official match, they had already taken a trophy home with them. Interestingly though, they would have to play in the Class B of the Moscow League, even though they showed that they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the city's elite. By the month of May, they had won the B-Class Spring Championship with ease. Not only the first team, but all three of their youth teams also won. After the spring season, there was a cup organized by St. Petersburg or by Petrograd club Kolomyagye. In this cup, the winners of the A, B, C, and D classes would face each other to declare the best team in Moscow. Moscow Sports Club first defeated the main military school of physical education of workers. Um, I think I need a cup of water just from saying that name. Anyway, this was a team who were the winners of the C class. In the final, they played against the A class winners, Oleus. This time, Moscow Sports Circle were fully expected to wipe the floor with their opponents, but instead, there was a downpour prior to the match, to the point that they had to discuss whether to play or postpone it. The parties chose to go on, and when it was over, the Presnya team would have come to no defeat for the first time. 
their youth team was still going strong though and managed to win this tournament in their division. In the Moscow fall season, things wouldn't be as easy as it was in a spring championship. Moscow Sports Club first team would start with a defeat to a club called CSR and begin the fall in fifth place. But after battling and managing to get going, they would take revenge on their rivals and only managed to win the fall season thanks to CSR losing their last match of the season. The Moscow League was run by Andrei Vashke. He was chairman of Sokolniki Club and his deputy in the league was ZKS vice president Nikolai Gubiev. This is the same guy from part one who introduced Nikolai Starostin to the RGO higher-ups. The two, Vashke and Gubiev, held meetings every Friday to settle on a schedule and resolve issues for the upcoming Sunday matches. These meetings were open to the public, so players as well as fans were found to be in attendance. In one of these meetings in the fall, they were leading a discussion regarding the Moscow team selection. The right-wing spot was held by Sergei Chesnokov, who was favored by Vashke, but now an up-and-comer brought in by Gubiev was competing for that position as well. So a voting session was held, and in a tight race, five hands were raised in favor of Chesnokov, and six for the newcomer. This newcomer was Nikolai Starostin. Pavel Kwanunikov and Viktor Prokofiev were also selected, leaving the first team with some holes to fill. But this was how the Soviet championship was played back then. It wasn't a national competition between the best clubs that determined the champion. It was a selection of the best players from cities against the corresponding selection of other cities playing in Petrograd to decide which city was champion. It may sound strange, but given the size of the country and the nature of the transportation system of that time, it was the most efficient way both economic and time-wise to compete against the rest of the country. Brazil also had a similar setup for their national championship back then as well. In any case, the young Nikolai was ecstatic. He couldn't believe it himself. After getting home, he still had such a look of disbelief that his mother, worried about him, had to ask him what was going on, only for Nikolai to casually answer that he was included in the Moscow selection and that the following day, he would be on his way to Petrograd. Andrei, who was 16 at the time, and Alexander, who was 18, could only believe it was happening when they saw Nikolai train-bound for Petrograd. During the trip, Nikolai couldn't sleep on the train. He complained that he was uncomfortable, but most importantly, he was nervous. When Nikolai Gubiev asked him what was wrong, and since Gubiev was the guy who advocated for his presence in the team, he couldn't let him know that he was scared. So he lied that his stomach was hurting. Well, Gubiev then dug out some medicine, a white powder, and made Nikolai ingest it. Now his stomach was really hurting, and I wonder if it was cocaine. Since it was seen as a medicine back then, it's completely plausible. Anyway, they were missing a few players from the usual selection as well. Guys like goalkeeper Sokolov and Fyodor Sielin, and Petrograd was already considered a superior team. When they arrived, They were greeted by the Petrograd team at the station, which was a classy thing old school teams used to do. They went out for breakfast at a hotel nearby. Now, could you imagine something like this these days? Picture Real Madrid greeting Barcelona at the airport, and then the two teams go out to eat before El Clasico. Yeah, right. Even if the players wanted, fans would just about kill themselves with anger. Continuing, Later on, Nikolai would overhear someone in the crowd say, Where is Filipov's victim? And he immediately knew it was about him. So if he was nervous before, now, I mean. The match itself would start with Petrograd going up 2-0, and it was looking like Moscow's young team were going to get stomped. But Nikolai broke through the flank, dribbled past their entire defense, and scored the first goal for the Muscovites. Right there and then, he had answered that he was no victim. The goal gave the visitors confidence, and Isakov and Prokofiev added two more goals. The Petrograd fans had already fallen silent, and only Gubiev's voice could be heard from the stands. 
The referee then apparently gifted the home team with a penalty. Batorev stroke it wide. The game then became heated and due to injury, center half Andrei Leporsky had to exit the contest with an injury. With no subs allowed back then, Moscow were down to 10 men. Petrograd managed to grab two goals and then the match would go on to end at 4-3 for their home side. A furious Gubiev called the referee a scoundrel, which he was punished for by not being allowed to travel with the selection to Petrograd in the future. But for the young Moscow team, they had earned the respect of Petrograd, who now escorted them as equals back to the train station. Nikolai Starostin, when he got back home, would recount the match to the astonishment of his brothers. Circling back to the big picture, the Civil War had, for all intensive purposes, come to an end. And still in 1922, with the country in horrible shape, something needed to be done urgently to boost the economy before things exploded. There were very real threats of yet another rebellion, and Lenin was well aware of that. So in order to give the economy that much-needed jumpstart, he launched the NEP, or New Economic Policy. During the previous period of war communism, the Soviets had nationalized industry, for example. They took control of banks and trade. Now, retail trades, services, entertainment, and a wide variety of consumer industries were allowed to return to previous or new ownership. This meant that now, peasants could sell their goods for profit, businesses were set up by small traders who became known as NEP men or net men. I'm, I've actually never heard the term said out loud. I've only read it, so it's either NEP men or NEP men. The government also relaxed on their demands regarding the adherence of the communist line. For example, now different nationalities could speak their own languages and follow their customs again. And remember, Russia was a mix of many different cultures from territories that it had conquered over its history. This policy allowed the economy to quickly pick back up and many to prosper, including the kulaks. Borders opened and international tourism connected the Soviet Union with the rest of the world's cultures again. There was a faction of the Communist Party who were unhappy with this policy because it promoted capitalist ideals and brought along with it aspects of capitalistic or Western societies. Things like class divisions were inevitable, for example. For Lenin, though, this was indeed a form of capitalism, but one he deemed necessary and called it state capitalism. The reappearance of expensive restaurants, fancy boutiques, and even dancing were examples of these undesired aspects. Luxurious and staple commodities were back. Of course, it doesn't help that people had been deprived of these things for so long that when they were able to get it back, it was like letting a kid have free range in a candy store. They'll take full advantage of it. These NEP men and women went all out on restaurants, nightclubs, casinos, and cafes, which were the scenes of drinking, gambling, dancing, drug-taking, and widely varietal sex. I mean, it was the antithesis of communism, as we had heard already. It was everything they had been fighting against. It's also not surprising that the NEP caused resentment, since not everyone was able to enjoy such privileges. This feeling was likely even more pronounced in the people who had fought in the war and returned only to find themselves in the midst of poverty, unemployment, and all-around less-than-ideal situations. These activities, businesses, and forms of entertainment had been associated either with the way things were before the revolution or as coming from the West, which to many would mean more of the same anyway, you know, class differences. However they were viewed, be it Tsarist or not, because of their commercial potential, the quote-unquote true communists saw them as inherently bad and that included sports and even movies. Football had especially been a sport that when first brought to Russia by the British was only played by the elites. And despite being accessible to the lower classes by this time, it still had that bourgeois stigma to the communists. Andrei Starostin tells us that for the Starostins at least, the NEP era drastically changed their lives economically speaking. 
They could now, for example, buy a French roll from an actual store instead of having to wait in a bread line or buy from some sketchy underground spot. He remembered not only there were changes from within their family, but also the outwardly appearance of the city itself had morphed. There were privately owned shops with signs outside because now private entrepreneurship was encouraged. Many cooperatives and commercial groups grew like mushrooms, as he put it. There were restaurants, cabarets, variety shows, bars, and they opened and worked until the early hours. He sums it up by saying, quote, The youth of my generation passed in complete contact with the lives and morals of this era. Moscow had not long ago been hungry. Now it was full of everything. The number of delicatessens, dairy stores, and vegetable shops grew not by the day, but by the hour. The tempo of life sped up. We went to sleep late and got up early, end quote. Doesn't seem like anything out of the ordinary from a modern, Western point of view, does it? Well, for Soviet Russia, this was a unique, special time. At some point between 1922 and 1923, Nikolai would have a rare, different, and unexpected encounter. While working at the central repair shops, he was sitting in the office during lunchtime when he suddenly looks out the window and sees a car stopped at the gate. He goes out there, and in the back seat, he sees none other than Vladimir Lenin. A frozen Nikolai introduces himself and is greeted by the Soviet leader. He tells us that a smiling Lenin went there to inspect a new tractor the shops had been working on. And by the time he was leaving, a crowd had gathered and in front of everyone, Lenin still made sure to say goodbye to Comrade Starostin. When Nikolai showed up to training afterwards, his teammates couldn't get enough of the story and were fascinated to the point that training became a number two priority that day. Not too long after that encounter, Lenin, whose health had been declining fast, would have gone into surgery to have a bullet from the previous assassination attempt removed from his body. They didn't know what was wrong with him and thought the bullet could be causing him this damage. Instead, he would suffer a stroke and become paralyzed down his right side and unable to speak for some time. One member of the Communist Party, Yosef Visarionovich Jugashvili, who now went by the name Joseph Stalin, well, he had actually gone by various different names in the past and settled with Stalin in 1912. Stalin is supposedly based on the word steel in Russian, and his name has been translated as Man of Steel. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't just give yourself a badass name like that. That's something you gotta earn and other people give it to you. Only people who can get away with giving themselves badass names are members of the Wu-Tang Clan, pro wrestlers, and MMA fighters. And even then, a salty record like 13 losses, 0 wins, and 1 no contest or something like that, that gets pretty sketchy. Anyway, sorry for the rant here. Stalin would be given a more prominent role in the party and take full advantage of the position by establishing loyalties around him to help further his progress within the party. And when Lenin finally died 10 months later in 1924, he would be in a position of massive influence in the Communist Party. In the years that followed, he would then use his influence to remove his opposition from within the party. But we're getting a little ahead here, so let's get back to 1923. That year, Nikolai Stadistin would get married to Antonina Nazarova, who lived in the same neighborhood. Her father was a kvass brewer. For those who don't know, kvass is a drink usually made from rye bread, and it looks like beer, but it's non-alcoholic. I mean, there's a little alcohol because of the fermentation, but it's negligible. It's kind of like, it's kind of like kombucha. It's got that fizzy feel to it too. Anyway, it's a super popular and delicious drink. And Nikolai's future father-in-law was a brewer. But at the wedding, the young Nikolai, perhaps trying to impress the bride's family, decided to pass on the kvass for some actual spirits. Well, he did leave an impression, but not the one he was going for. You see, he wasn't used to drinking, so he got hammered to the point where some of his wife's family members were concerned that she might have married a drunk. Poor Nikolai. 
Back to Moscow's developing world of soccer, that season would see Moscow Sports Club get their shot at the Class A division of Moscow. However, there would be some changes, and results-wise, things would be a little different as well. First, the district of Presnya was renamed to Krasnaya Presnya, in tribute to the 1905 event we covered in part one of the series. Then, popular opinion managed to win over the club, and they would officially be called Krasnaya Presnya as well. Then there was the fact that they were amateurs. This is where waters begin to murk in the Starostens' lives. In general, despite being able to make some money from the clubs, players still had jobs. As we've mentioned before, Nikolai worked at a tractor manufacturing plant and Ivan Artemiev worked as a shoemaker, for example. But like in most other countries, there was a time period in which the sport began to transition into professionalism. Clubs began compensating their players in order to have them available for training or matches while allowing them to make a living as well. And, and money was also used as a way to lure players from one club to another. So, so if before they were purely amateurs, now we're starting to see a shift where one club would like to get this player playing for them because better players means better team, better team means more support, more support means more cash flow for the clubs, and it's a cycle, it feeds itself. So they start to offer players money to make transfers, as well as to make up for the fact that if a player has to work, doesn't have time to train, or the player just you know has to choose between either work or football, then the club makes a decision to compensate that player, and that's how the cycle begins. Well, the problem here was that the Soviet government didn't want sports to be commercialized, the same way that was happening in capitalist countries. So they put up barriers discouraging commercial practices, also because, you know, they were communists and communists hate money. Before the end of 1922, the All-Union Central Executive Committee, the most powerful state institution then, created the Supreme Council for Physical Culture, and they decided that clubs were going to follow a quote-unquote territorial production basis. This meant that teams needed to be composed of players from a single district or factory now. The idea was to curb player transfers, which in theory should halt the advancement of professionalism. If you can't make transfers, then you don't need to offer other players more or less compensation in order to persuade them to join you. Essentially, you will get those players in your district or factory and shut your pie hole. In any event, as a result, many of the relatively speaking storied and traditional Moscow clubs would disappear. The likes of Oles, ZKS were now gone, essentially giving way to new nationalized institutions, clubs that would take over the existing infrastructure just as it had happened to old businesses and this was happening everywhere in the Soviet Union. This in part is where you cross the line from socialism to actual communism, this state takeover. Before the new season on April 18th, 1923 would mark the birth of the proletarian sports society Dinamo, which was supposed to unite the athletes working in the police, in the Cheka, or the OGPU. According to Andrei, there had been a lot of rumors in Moscow, a lot of arguing about which of the famous players were going to this new team with an unusual name. However, they all agreed on one thing. This sports society was created on an impressive foundation. An odd thing is that people didn't really get the name of the club at first, Dynamo or Dynamo in English. They didn't know what it meant. But Andre goes on to say that the club's name was confusing at first, but later it was clarified by Maxim Gorky himself. He said, quote, True, most did not understand what the name Dynamo means. It became clear later when Alexei Maximovich Gorky, at a meeting with the sportsmen of the society, expressed satisfaction with the name, saying, Dynamo is a force in motion, end quote. Indeed, but this new club's creation was not intended to only take part. Their intention was to dominate. Going back to the notion of clubs buying and selling players, this was a nightmare scenario for the state, which is why they were putting up these barriers. But despite that, soccer had already managed to at least partially go down the commercial path. 
Being such a popular form of entertainment, the demand for match attendance was incredibly high, especially when it came to the provinces, away from the big cities, as there were so few league matches to be played. And just as an example, in 1922, Krasnaya Presnya only played a total of nine games for the league. To get around that, clubs learned to fill the remaining time touring around and playing exhibition games. Now this allowed them to make a relatively significant amount of money. Krasnaya Presnya was able to squeeze in 14 of these friendlies between the end of April and October with one match in particular attracting as many as 10,000 spectators. People in the provinces had their own clubs, but the presence of high-level players and the chance to see their team against these stars was something people craved. Nikolai himself would describe the need for money. He said, quote, All our budget depended on ticket sales. At the club, everyone was given a single jersey for the year, which we cherished like a shrine. The rest of the equipment, we had to buy it ourselves. Ivan Artemiev's specialty was as a shoemaker, so he supplied us all with fine, light, elegant boots for half of the existing price, or as he joked, at cost price, end quote. So although the Soviet government didn't necessarily like it, there wasn't much they could do to stop it at that point. But as a club, if we were to think about how your main source of revenue is coming from attendance numbers, it won't be long until we conclude that for people to want to watch you play, you need to be winning. And for you to be winning, you need to have good players. Ivan Artemiev then decided to invite the best players of the now-dissolved ZKS to the Presnya. Then we get the Professor Peter Isakov finally making his move along with Sergei Buteyev, the central midfielder from Novogiryeva. The club now had several players that were Moscow Select level, and their presence provided a massive incline in competition for a place in the Presnya first team. The spring championship was initially cancelled because of the reorganization of the entire sports community in Moscow, but with three clubs in Krasnaya Presnya, Mosove and Dinamo leading the effort to bring it back, it was eventually made to happen. Before the start of the season, they played some friendlies and in one of them, on May 6th, is where we get the first record of Krasnaya Presnya wearing their now famous red shirts. The Presnya team would go on to win the Class A spring season just as they had won a B class the previous year. This qualified them for the Cup of Toshmen, aka Two Capitals Champions Cup, which was held in Petrograd, just like the previous Kolomyagya Cup. In any event, it's self-explanatory. The cup was played between the champions of Moscow and the champions of Petrograd, who happened to be Kolomyagya. As for the result, the Muscovites lost to the Petrograders by 3-1. The next day, they played a friendly against the Petrograd Select and, no doubt fatigued, were beaten by 5-0. For a final balance of that season, even though they lost the Toshman Cup, the Moscow Spring Championship was a good result. But the same can't be said for the Fall Championship, where they finished dead last. There was a good explanation for it, though. Five of their best players, Kwanunikov, Isakov, both Artemiev's and Maslov, had all been called away on a tour of Scandinavia with the Soviet national team. This was a frustrating part of the game at that time. Without much notice, at any given moment, players could just be called up to represent the Soviet national team, and it happened often, and oftentimes it happened in the most inconvenient moments for their clubs. And clubs back then didn't have a say as they often do in today's game, especially in the Soviet Union. The real hit, though, would come after the season ended. Krasnaya Presnya would suffer an unexpected and quite shocking exit. The great Ivan Artemiev no longer wished to play for the club and joined newly created club Dinamo Moscow. With the departure of Ivan Artemiev, Pavel Kwanunikov was offered the captaincy, but for whatever reason he refused. The club then turned to Nikolai Starostin, who, following in Ivan's footsteps, accepted the leadership role with open arms. The reason for Artemiev's exit, though, isn't entirely clear. Nikolai Starostin, in the book Spring of the Patriarch, says that it was the arrival of the new players which made it more difficult for Artemiev. 
He said, quote, In skill, he was inferior to Bukhtiev, and the coach had played the central midfielder instead of Artemiev in one of the decisive matches. This seemed to him undeserved, and he grew resentful and left the Presnia. He directed all his irrepressible energy to the formation of the new Dinamo Society's football team, and so he forever inscribed his name in the history of Soviet football. And Nikolai finishes his passage with, Along with him, only Dmitry Maslov left us. All the rest, including the rest of the Artemiev brothers, remained true to their native Presnya. I think that the soul of Ivan was still with us, but his legs and head now served Dinamo. End quote. Now that's one take. In his wonderful book, Spartak Moscow, A History of the People's Team in the Workers' State, Robert Edelman, while confirming that the reasons aren't clear, puts forth the following theory. Quote, in his final memoir, Nikolai Statistin suggested that becoming captain in 1923, he had inadvertently insulted Ivan by not naming him to the starting eleven for an important but unspecified match. More likely, Artemiev was recruited by Dinamo during the Soviet select successful autumn tour of Scandinavia. Indeed, Nikolai's 1969 and 1986 memoirs contradict his 1989 account, noting that he became captain of Krasnaya Presnya only after Artemiev had left. More probably, a true political believer like Artemiev, while attracted to the goals of Dinamo, was especially interested in the drama of starting yet another new club. End quote. So, whether it was because he wanted a new challenge or because he was offended that he wasn't picked for a particular match, Ivan Artemiev went on that Scandinavian tour and when he returned, decided to take his talents to quote a famous basketball player elsewhere. That elsewhere just happened to be the newly found Dinamo Sports Society. From Andrei's perspective, when speaking about the new club's infrastructure, he was reminded of his own Gariuchka, but with one main difference. And this difference is what would seem to separate Dinamo from the rest of the other clubs. He said, quote, When I first saw the modest possessions of Dinamo, it seemed to me like a refined Gariuchka. True, the order here was exemplary. The audience was going to a restrained stadium. The dead horse was not lying on the field. It was marked by white chalk lines. The attention of the ushers who met visitors, politely and busily explaining the location of the seats in the stands, reinforced the impression of order. It was felt that everything here was thought through to the smallest detail and that this organization of the matter is the foundation for the sporting work of this new society. End quote. So that's the difference, the order and structure of things. It's very in line with the ideals of communism, not necessarily the outcome, but certainly the ideals. When the next season came about, the new captain, Nikolai Statistin, went to work in bringing over reinforcements. He fetched the services of Peter Popov and Konstantin Blinkov, former ZKS players, then Konstantin's younger brother, Vladimir, as well as goalkeeper Boris Baklashev. We also saw the promotion of Nikolai's brother, Alexander, to the senior team. So now both Nikolai and Alexander are playing on the same side. While Nikolai's networking abilities and business acumen were, were beginning to flourish for Krasnaya Presnya, he was also becoming a dangerous presence on the field himself. He was the typical winger with a simple style, up and down the flanks, but what set him apart was a mix of speed, work rate, and fearlessness with which he would cause opponents to wilt under his relentless efforts. He was also praised for his heading ability and his powerful strikes. Their first match of the 24 season would be against Dinamo, which ended in a 1-1 draw. They then picked up three wins in a row and went on to technically win the spring championship. However... You will notice I said technically, and that is because there were some incredibly goofy, goofy changes to the rules made by the Soviets, and to determine the best team, they would take into account things like average number of points, the average number of players used, the minimum number of players used, warnings, disqualifications, penalties the participation of players in other sports as well as the amount of work 
with district cells of physical culture. I mean, what were they thinking? And no doubt this was the Communist Party's influence. So taking all this criteria into account, Krasnaya Presnya finished fifth. But in the conventional method of point counting, they were first. In fact, there were newspapers actually referring to them as champions anyway. Meanwhile, this all happened away from home since their home stadium was undergoing an expansion. More people, more ticket sales, more money. One has to wonder if Nikolai had a hand in this. In the reopening of the stadium on July 20th, they would play a friendly match against Raikomvod Yacht Club, former club of the newly acquired Peter Popov and Konstantin Blinkov, so this was former ZKS. The Presninsky won by 4-2 with Nikolai scoring one and providing two assists to Kwanunikov. August 8th marked their first ever international match in a meeting against a workers' team from Norway called AMF. A record-smashing 11,000 spectators witnessed Krasnaya Presnya win by 2-0, with both goals scored by Kwanunikov. Two days later, the same Norwegian club, AMF, would play against the Moscow Select and take a 9-0 humbling. Peter Artemyev with a hat-trick, and both Nikolai and Kwanunikov got a brace each. Just to be clear, I mentioned earlier that the Soviets had ended their international isolation, but it was only to a certain extent. They weren't members of FIFA and thus not able to have sanctioned matches against uh, many other teams, many other national teams. What they could do, though, is play against amateurs or workers' teams from the Communist Red Sport International and Social Democrats organizations. Returning to Krasnaya Presnya's season, in the Autumn Championship, they would win all of their matches except two meetings against Raikamvod Yacht Club. The first away, they lost 3-1. The second at home, down 2-0 at the half, when Yakov Yevstigneev had to abandon the match due to injury. Since there were no subs back then, they returned to the field with 10 men. It's unclear what position he played, but it must have made quite the difference since the final result was a 7-1 drubbing, with Nikolai being the one to break the goose for the Presnya. Now, I'm no Michael Cox here, but at times like these, it's probably when such an unbalanced formation like the 2-3-5 those teams were playing then became a big problem. Even if you slid someone to cover for the absent player, the other team probably easily exploited all the gaps that existed in the defense. And mostly so if that player that was missing was not part of the attack. Despite this disappointing result, they still made it to the Cup of Toshman in Petrograd, which had then been renamed to Leningrad. There, they would play against and beat, by a score of 3-1, a team with an interesting name. That name is Spartak Leningrad. Even more intriguing is the fact that this Spartak team, which was created in 1922, was taking full advantage of the NEP period and gobbling up the majority of the pre-revolution clubs of the old capital. They too went the commercial route to increase their financial power, but in their case, they had stores and publications bringing in revenue for them. It wasn't long until high-up officials ended up getting involved and Icarus found himself to have flown too close to the sun. I mean, considering the ideas of the Communist Party, the powers in charge of the government, and how they went about enforcing their laws, it sure seems like an incredibly risky position to put yourself in if you're Spartak Leningrad. One could extend the sentiment for everyone involved in the commercial world after the introduction of the NEP. Sure, we can say we have the benefit of hindsight to weigh in on a prospect, but it's not like there weren't precedents for them either, right? The Bolsheviks had previously been seizing control of businesses and properties from people. Not only that, many were killed or exiled. It would just be really interesting to know what their thought process was, but it's definitely something you would have to be cautious about back then. In 1925, more improvements were made to the Krasnaya Presnya Stadium, with a new fence being built. And yet, more changes to the championship schedule were made. This time, though, there would only be one championship edition, running from the end of June to October. June 21st, Krasnaya Presnya lost their first match, then bounced back with a 4-0 smacking of the new kids on the block, Dinamo. 
But in between these first two matches of the Moscow Championship, on June 27th, they played a friendly against one of the best teams in the entire Soviet Union, Ukrainian side Odessa. Even though they won 2-1, the highlight of the match comes in the form of Valentin Prakofiev. This young man was so incredibly fast and impressive that Nikolai felt the need to do something about it. So somehow, despite rules prohibiting the transfer of players mid-season, with his connections and business savvy, he had Valentin Prakofiev, the first non-Presnia resident, joining the team by August 9th. Nikolai acknowledges this in his writing. He said, quote, We were very proud that everything in Krasnaya Presnia was of local origin. However, in time, we realized that for a successful game in the higher league, we needed reinforcements, end quote. As we can see, the man knew what he was doing. He understood that the need to entertain on the pitch would translate into financial success. Robert Edelman completes the image with this, quote, Their new left winger only added to Krasnaya Presnya's reputation as an attacking side, anchored in the back by Alexander Starostin's defense, with Konstantin Kvashnin and Peter Artemiev at halfback, Nikolai was free to roam the right flank, feeding Isakov, Kwanunikov, Prakofiev, and Blinkov. In an era when the point of football was to score more goals than the opponent, Krasnaya Presnya scored goals. It was an offensive side that understood the need to entertain an audience, end quote. So even though they didn't win the Moscow Championship, in terms of growth for the club, the season was a success. Just to have an idea, that year, Presnia went on to play 23 friendlies. The presence of a given club's players in the Soviet national team brought about prestige. This translated into an increase in spectatorship for club matches featuring these types of players. It was the entertainment factor. The NEP and its relative commercial freedom was allowing those who were business savvy to make a lot of money. So Nikolai, having had a compatible upbringing, education, and connections along with the talent for this type of environment, was pretty much starting to make it rain for Krasnaya Presnya. Now, no longer was the budget just enough to get by. As Robert Edelman writes, quote, At this early stage of Soviet soccer, the discipline of serious conditioning had not yet become a priority. And now that they were well compensated, players were freer to sample the NEP's good life. The young players of Krasnaya Presnya, it turned out, adapted perhaps too well to this set of circumstances. In their recollections, all shared an enormous sense of excitement that after restrictions and deprivation of the pre-revolutionary years, they were now playing organized football with good equipment on nice fields before large and appreciative crowds of spectators. Their names appeared in newspapers and magazines. Their faces were known to strangers, end quote. And to complement what Edelman said, another feature of that NEP life for the top players was that of celebrity status and money. They were now dressing in the latest fashions, often visiting the hottest restaurants, shows, clubs, and cabarets. More than a few of the Krasnaya Presnya players were definitely about that life. Unfortunately, there's a lack of information regarding this aspect of their lives. Even other footballers of the time don't really go into that much detail. But they couldn't have been too different and surely could have been found in enjoying themselves as well. Nikolai did have a reputation for being more of a straight-edge character, but even he wasn't opposed to mingling, even if only for networking purposes. He was a businessman after all. Andrei Starostin particularly seemed to be more involved either because he was the only one to write extensively about it or more extensively about it, or because he really was more involved than everybody else. But many restaurants and cafes that were located on Ferskaya Street were hot spots for popular figures of the time, including footballers. The Starostins, mainly, it seems Andre, would come to spend a significant amount of time having a good time, talking tactics and mingling with the who's who of Moscow's art culture, be them literary figures, actors, or musicians. And it wasn't uncommon either to see high-end professional ladies of the night strolling around Tverskaya Street. And the fact that, as Andre put it, there were closed booth restaurants working day and night. I think it's safe to say that the ladies' presence meant that 
there was a clientele that was hungry for their services as well. The Starostins also had a love for horses, something they had inherited from their father. So they followed in his footsteps, going to horse racing and betting on them. Another thing André enjoyed was professional wrestling, and he was friends with a few of the stars of the era. Pool halls, billiards, and casinos were also on their menu. Now, whatever the case, and it's always important to emphasize that this is in hindsight, it seems that they were pushing their luck with the Communist Party here. Were they beginning to go the way of that ill-fated Spartak Leningrad, that rapidly growing club that pushed the limits of the Soviet officials' patience and paid dearly for their carelessness? Their lifestyle, in contrast to the rest of the Soviet Union, would have seemed ostentatious. And now, with Lenin gone, the NEP era would have its days numbered. But while it still hung around, now as the main man at Krasnaya Presnya, Nikolai will use the NEP to position the club for future success. But as usual, it will not be without struggle. As we'll see in part 3, the Starostins will have to stay on their toes to make it in the ever-changing landscape of the Soviet Union. From here on out, the changes will come at seemingly lightning speed. Their hard work will bear fruit, but the stakes will dramatically increase along with their visibility as they become more prominent figures in the Soviet Union. Thank you very much for listening. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at Round History. You can also find us at roundhistory.com for some artwork and for some extra information on each episode, as well as contact information. This was Round History. Round History.